follow all the election insanity with the State of the Race podcast. It's free for you wherever you get your podcast. Just go to the Studios America stream, sign up, and uh, I think we're going to do a new one on Friday. So we'll have updates leading up to New Hampshire and, of course, all the details as they break as well. You can go to YouTube.com slash Stu Does America. Be sure to subscribe, like the videos, and hit the bell for notifications. All the things that a good podcast listener does. Glenn Beck is going to be here to tell us why everything we've done here at Blaze TV has been leading up to this very moment. Joe Biden's 2024 struggles continue to escalate in important states. I'll tell you who's turning on him now. But we start by doing the end of affirmative action. You know, we're in such a weird time where people have, I don't know, reversed everything I thought I knew, everything I thought we were shooting for especially when it comes to the issue of race, has seemingly been reversed lately. Back in the day, we all sort of agreed. I thought we were striving for a world in which we didn't really care about skin color. It was a dumb side issue. It's not how you judged people. You didn't pick your friends based on skin color. You didn't pick anything based on skin color. Everyone tried to just do their best to ignore it and judge people based on who they were. And that has just been completely upended over the past few years. And I think to negative effect, I'm not a fan of those changes. Now, one of the main people in the media driving those changes, and again, she's not smart enough to be the author of any of these thoughts, but she's, you know, she's uh, capable of reading Ibram Kendi's books and such and sort of regurgitating them poorly on MSNBC. This is, of course, when she's not posting, obviously, homophobic stuff on her own website. Joy Reid. Now, you might not know who Joy Reid is. You could be forgiven for that. She doesn't really make a lot of noise, but she is constantly still on MSNBC somehow, the, the one person who's never had to uh, answer for her homophobic comments, the one person who's been able to avoid that for some reason is Joy Reid. And now she's on to uh, some sort of social justice kick over the past few years, and she maintains a show that's on regularly on MSNBC, and she was on their election coverage the other night. Now, she, it's important to understand with Joy Reid, she is convinced she's smart. And I and I like anyone who would watch her would know the obvious is true, but the opposite is obviously true. But she is still caught in this weird sort of circle where she thinks she's really, really brilliant. And she's coming up with these really smart insights. And MSNBC, to, you know, to, to her credit, uh, keeps forking over money to her uh, for these bizarre viewpoints. Here's one of them. This is her trying to parse why Ron DeSantis was able to defeat Nikki Haley in Iowa. I feel like the, the important sort of data point, and, and you know, Steve talks about it a lot. He's he's going to probably talk about it a little more tonight. Is that these these are white Christians? That this is a state that is overrepresented overrepresented by white Christians that are going to participate in these tonight. caucuses, yes. especially tonight. Um, I today earlier today reached out to Robert Jones, Robbie Jones um, from the Public Religion Research Institute, knowing that we were going to talk about Iowa, and this is a hyper evangelical st- white state. And he said the following to me: Iowa is about 61 percent white Christian. The country as a whole is approximately 41 percent white Christian. And in Iowa, we're talking about evangelical white Christians. And he said the following. Because I asked him, what do they get out of supporting Donald Trump? Because he keeps losing, he keeps delivering losses and losses and losses. And he said the following, they see themselves as the rightful inheritors of this country. And Trump has promised to give it back to them. All the things that we think about, about electability, about, you know, what are people gaming out or Mm -hmm. none of that matters Mm -hmm. when you believe that God has given you this country, that it is yours and that everyone who is not a white conservative Christian is a is a fraudulent American, is a less. Less, a less real American, then you don't care about electability. You care about what God has given uh, I was on the Megan Kelly show with Dave Marcus when we played this clip, and Dave said, I think the person in the control room was just like, I, I don't know, hit a graphic or something, shut her up. Because that, that is kind of what it felt like. This is one of the most obviously insane rants I think anyone's ever heard, to go through some of it. Um, we are a hyper, I was a hyper evangelical white state. Can you imagine someone saying the opposite about a community that maybe had a large minority population? Oh, it's just a hyper Asian state. Uh, who would even think about the world this way? And the fact that it has, look, 
I mean, look, the fundamental makeup demographically of the United States for a very long time has been largely white and Christian. That's not a huge, doesn't mean anything other than it's just the percentage makeup. Uh, But she's very freaked out about it. And she says that they, which are white Christians, So we're just going to make blanket statements about an entire group of people, white Christians, because we're the racists. She's going to make, I'm talking about Joy Reid specifically. She's talking about all white Christians. White Christians see themselves as the rightful inheritors of this country, and Trump has promised to give it back to them. And she says that when you believe that God has given you this country, it is yours and that everyone who is not a white conservative Christian is a fraudulent American. I want you to know, I know a lot of white conservative Christians, and I have never in my entire life met anyone who believes that. Never. And you know what? If I did, they wouldn't be my friends because that's an insane viewpoint. Who, who thinks this way? Who thinks that a country is given to a particular color. It's certainly not a very American viewpoint to think, oh, well, white people get this country. We'll give black people that country and Asian people get that country and Hispanics get that country. No, every country has borders. And inside of those borders are a makeup of a bunch of different people. Some are majority black countries or majority white countries. But that doesn't mean that that is a specific and some sort of weird uh, inheritance that you get based on your skin tone. Who believes this nonsense? Joy Reid does. And that's kind of the theme of what we're talking about today. Because there are people like Joy Reid who believe these things. And it's a fascinating change in our political culture. And it's one that is presenting an amazing opportunity for conservatives specifically. Let me go through this. And we all know that the uh, this this idiotic viewpoint of Joy Reid is a lot more prevalent than it used to be. This was not the way that people talked about race pretty recently. I mean, like this has been this Ibram Kendi, this white fragility uh, viewpoint has been sort of taking the world by storm, the CRT view on race. And it's this idea of uh, uh, that every white person is racist, every black person is oppressed, um, this systemic racism that is talked about all the time. And it should be talked about the same way we talk about any other conspiracy theory. If you sit here and you think, well, all Jews are out to control the media, that is the almost identical viewpoint to someone saying, well, all white people are racist and oppressing me. You're assigning a characteristic to millions and millions and millions of people that you don't know based solely on their, the pigment of their skin. That is the it's fundamentally racist. It's, it's exactly what racism has always been and should remain. We shouldn't be changing the definitions of these words when they get it a little inconvenient. And on her point with DeSantis specifically was that, well, DeSantis only beat Haley because he's white and she is a, she's a brown person, I believe is what she called her in the other clip. Um, look, on paper, I think you can make a very clear argument that Ron DeSantis is a better presidential candidate in 2024 than uh, Nikki Haley is. I mean, look, she, she has viewpoints that are kind of out of the mainstream of the Republican uh, ethos at this point. Um, and I'm not saying I, I got nothing against Nikki Haley, really. But, she, you know, that's kind of she's not really in that, you know, the, the zeitgeist of Republican thought and conservative energy at this point. She's also hasn't been a governor for a long time. She ha- isn't really been in the news cycle. She did serve in the Trump administration a, a bunch of years ago. But Ron DeSantis just won a, a, a landslide election like a year ago. Like he you'd think he'd be head and shoulders above her. And that was kind of the thought coming in. He also spent a fortune in this state and put all of his resources into Iowa and then beat her by two points. And the way we're going to describe that is all white Christians think they're getting the country handed to them. I mean, this is bonkers. I'm going way too long on this. Let me just give you a a couple of things. Nikki Haley was asked about whether it is a racist country. She said, no, it's never been a racist country. And look, obviously there have been times in this country where racism was a major, major problem. And of course it is for some people even today. Joy Reid comes to mind. But like, 
The question is, and she tried to back off uh, this comment. She backed off uh, uh, off of this as well. She had the whole uh, slavery thing. She said Nikki Haley, we, we sh- uh, should have said slavery in Civil War was uh, in, in her Civil War answer. You remember that controversy from before? She's tried to back off of a couple of these controversies. But like the only thing I've said, we obviously have had really bad times with race in this country. But my problem with saying something like we have a racist country is we're blaming the country, right? We're blaming the country instead of the people, the individuals who hold those viewpoints. Those people, right now, we, are we a racist country now? Well, there are people in the country who are racist. Does that mean you have a racist country? What does that mean you have a racist country? I guess you could have a situation like Nazi Germany, where you had laws specifically banning certain races from doing certain things. Well, we don't have that in America anymore. Maybe we did at one point, and certainly a uh, a racist country is a fair description of a country that has Jim Crow laws, for example, at least those areas. You could certainly say that. But blaming an entire country for things isn't always the best approach. And we should start thinking about that more specifically. Start talking about people as individuals and stop talking about people as members of groups. If you can do that, you gotta solve most of these problems almost right away. And what's interesting is the Supreme Court had this big ruling about affirmative action. And it was of course talked about by people like Joy Reid as this terrible, terrible ruling where, um, I mean, of course it again was about racism, it was. It was about how Asian people, Asian students in particular, kept getting kicked out of Harvard and not getting into Harvard. Why? Because there, there were too many Asians that were good at math and too many Asians who were good at school. And they, so they said, well, we have too many Asians here. You guys are going to get left off to the side. You go to another school that's maybe not as uh, academically rigorous and we'll let other people in, like white people, who aren't as good uh, as, as you guys are at math. And uh, we'll let them in because uh, we need to have a diverse population. We can't be looking at test scores after all. What's well, unfair to Asians who are achieving? If they achieve more than white people or black people or Hispanic people or whatever, they should get those roles because those are roles that should be based on merit. I thought we all agreed on that. And, and the funny thing is, it's a lot closer to full agreement than you might think. Majority of U.S. adults say they view the affirmative action ban favorably. All the negative media attention that came out over that race or over that case, and it almost across the board, you're seeing agreement with that. People saying, you know, I don't think we should make decisions based on skin color. Again, a fundamental thing that a society built on individual merit should cherish, but lately has been kind of put in the back burner. Let me give you some of the cross tabs here. Um, As a result of this decision, do you think college campuses will be more diverse or less diverse? Um, Most people say it will be slightly less diverse, which is interesting if you go across all age groups. Uh, Pretty much everybody says that, including evil white people. And one of the reasons why that happens is, I think, reflected in these other polls. Overall, what impact do you think the Supreme Court's decision ending the use of race or ethnicity in college and university admissions will have on higher education in the United States? Well, most groups say it will have a mostly uh, or slightly positive impact impact. Asian adults, of course, say that. They were the beneficiaries of this and, 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 and I believe correct decision, but Hispanic adults agree. White adults agree. Black adults do not agree, although there's more on that here coming up in just a minute, because um, it, it, it matters. Uh, the difference here matters, and we'll, we'll, we'll break that down in a second. How much will the Supreme Court ruling in uh, Students for, uh, for Fair Admissions impact your decision about what college you might apply to? Asian adults say mu- a lot, 73 percent. Everyone else is under 50 percent. And as As a result of this decision, do you think it will be easier or harder for applicants of your race or ethnicity to attend college or university? Um, Mostly, you see here, uh, slightly easier, say, uh, Asian students, uh, black students say it will be more difficult. Hispanic adults are split. White adults say it will be easier. Um, These views are affected, though, by age. And I think this is what's kind of interesting about the breakdown of these polls. Post-affirmative action views or on admissions differ by race. Is it mostly a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, U.S. adults, 68% say it's mostly a good thing. Only 32% mostly a bad thing. For Asian adults, 63% say it is a good thing. 38% say it is a bad thing. 
Now, black adults, which I mentioned, they had said in these polls it may be harder for them to get into some of these universities. They still, by a smaller margin, but still view it as a good thing. 52 to 48. Hispanic adults, 68 to 32. White adults, 72 to 28. Over and over again, each group, every breakdown, shows that they think it's a good thing, even though some of them said, as I noted, might be a little harder to get into school, might be uh, less diverse uh, as a result on campus. Why? Why would they view it positively if they think it's going to make this, the, the school less diverse or make it more difficult to get into? Why? Because they say it shouldn't be judged on skin color, regardless of the results, even if it makes it more difficult for me to get to college, even if it makes the, con- the, the uh, student body a little less, maybe there's more Asians than many on the left can stand. It's still a good thing because when you don't judge based on skin color, it's good on its own. No matter what the result is, if you're not making decisions based that way, it's positive. And almost everyone at least used to see it that way. And I think the view is changing because younger African-Americans are seeing this issue much differently than previous generations. Age plays a key role in black views on affirmative action case. If you look at national adults, it's 68 to 32. I think it's a good thing. Black adults, it's 52 to 48. However, if you go over 40 years old, it's, it's seen negatively. Now, look, there's a good reason for that. There, there's, we have some really bad history when it comes a, a way that African Americans were treated in this country. But when it's 56, 44 negative, if you're over 40 um, years old. But for younger African Americans who have come up in a different age, who have who've looked at this and, and look, they may very well see instances of racism. They might not like that. Of course not. But They still see that ruling positively, 62 to 38, an overwhelmingly positive reaction because they, too, don't want to be judged by the color of their skin. Nobody does. Nobody should. That should be, I think, a fundamentally obvious thing, especially for a country like this. And if you want to bring the politics into this for a second, like Joy Reid did, this is a tremendous opportunity for Republicans, for conservatives, for those on the right. If you go back to the back in the day, Abraham Lincoln, a Republican, had all sorts of advantage, uh, advances when it comes to racial equality in this country. He's kind of well known for such things, right? And so racial equality was seen as something that was an asset for Republicans for a, a century. And then in the 1960s, Democrats were successfully able to wrestle that issue away. Uh, all sorts of strife went on. We know the political changes. We've been over them 100 times. You know how, that, how that's worked. And for, for about 50 years, it really became a Democratic issue, an issue that the left would hit the right on all the time, that the left would, have to, would hit the right on and the right would have to defend themselves. No, we're not racist. This policy is not racist. We swear, we swear, we swear, over and over and over and over again. And the left kept just saying, you know what? We want people judged fairly based not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. And they were successfully able to utilize that as a political issue for a very long time. The principle was clear to everyone. Of course, that's the appropriate principle. The people who are judging uh, people on basis of the color of their skin are the bad ones. And the left was able, with the media's help, to say, well, it's the Republicans who are doing that. And that lasted for 50 years. But here we are now where the opposite is true where quite clearly the group of people who want to judge others by the color of their skin when we're talking about an ideology is the left. They now are on that bandwagon. This is the ultimate gift. This very successful weapon that has been utilized by politicians on the left almost exclusively falsely over the years, at least recently, is now an opportunity for conservatives. And conservatives have to be outward and address this head on. Point out that the problem we have is not just wokeness here, but trying to revive a a philosophy that has burned people over and over and over again. Sometimes, literally, it's a bad philosophy. Judging people this way leads to terrible, terrible things. And one side of the argument wants to bring it back. It's a terrible terrible idea and an instinct that is all too human, unfortunately, and if let to get out of control can lead to terrible, terrible things. Republicans, conservatives must treat this as an opportunity and they must 
must not screw this up. I know we say this all the time. Republicans find ways to bring defeat out of the jaws of victory. But this is a really important one. Not only is it important politically, but it's right. It's good. It's just. So please, for once, Republicans, don't screw this up. This past December, drug shortages hit a record high, and this is causing severe disruptions in medical treatments. There are delays, treatment cancellations, there's uh, rationing of vital medications. You need to be prepared, not just with water, not just with food, not just with shelter, but even your medicine. It's important to have that. Doctors are saying that they may be forced to make impossible choices, including choosing which patients will get the medication, which one won't. This is, again, supposed to be America. This is not supposed to happen. But if you get the Jace case, you can make sure it doesn't happen to you. It's a personalized emergency kit that contains five essential antibiotics that treat the most common and deadly bacterial infections. Plus, you can buy a gift card for your family or loved one so that they can get a Jace case of their own and personalize it to their needs. Everyone should be empowered to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. So get yours today. They have all sorts of uh, medication solutions, even for long-term storage as well. Jace Medical does a great job doing this. So check them out, jacemedical.com. The code is STU. Uh, you get a discount on the order when you use that code. The promo code is STU at jacemedical.com, J-A-S-E medical.com. I'm joined now by Glenn Beck. He has a brand new special coming up 9 p.m. Eastern tonight. It is called Globalist Takeover of America's Economy is Nearly Complete. Glenn, how's it going? Disinformation, <laughs> Stu. Yeah. Disinformation. I, I did realize after I said it, it's a weird question to say, how's it going after you yeah. said the world economy <laughs> is almost taken over? Well, I will tell you, tonight is, t- tonight is their worst nightmare. And I mean that sincerely. Did you know that... It's not just an election year here, but about never before has it been like this. About 50 percent of the world is having elections this year. Oh, really? 50 percent. I've not heard that. Okay, that's why they're saying at the World Economic Forum today that disinformation and misinformation is more important than global warming. It's more important than the economy. It has to be taken care of right now. Okay. Because 50% of the world is about to say, I don't think this is working, or I love it, I want more of it, okay? So the disinformation from the governments all around the world is through the roof. For instance, we're going to take on the U.S. economy today. I'm going to show you charts and actual facts where you can go look them up yourself, and I'll show you what's happening in our economy It will stun you. Anybody who looks at these charts will know this is not working. This is really bad. Did you know we did a trillion dollar stealth stimulus? Uh, Uh Uh-huh. A trillion dollars. Didn't know it. A did st- not. What is a st- describe to me what a stealth stimulus is. Where is that uh, found in our constitution? Stimul- it's not. Okay. It's, well, it's in the stealthy part of the constitution. Okay. You so know stealthy I mean? you can't it's see it? It's in the secret mm-hmm. part yeah. that mm-hmm. only global elites with special Ben Franklin <laughs> glasses can see. Okay. Um, yeah, we did a trillion dollar stealth stimulus. Um, and uh, I'll show you when they did it. I'll show you. you can see it in the, in the, in the uh, charts. Um, Things are not going well, but they need to keep this on track until the global elections. If the people rise up and see, no, this is not working, then they'll pick another direction. Mm -hmm. And it's critical. That's why the WEF is truly freaking out. They're not freaking out because... Uh, You know, we told you about ESG and because they'll just change the name, which they're doing. They just change the name. Do something else. Uh, Do the same thing. Call it something else. Sure. What they are concerned about is that the stats show this is a disaster that is going to manifest. It's this is the first year that you can actually measure the effects of what they've done. So they passed all these things, and it's now starting Mm. to come into play. And you can see, with all of the stats, what's actually happening. And it's not good. And all of the trends are steep down. 
And we are seeing signs early maybe of people stepping up and trying to stop this. I mean, Malay is the obvious example Yeah. Uh, where he, I mean, I, I mean, we've done the show together for a long time. Did we ever see, ever think we'd see a figure like Malay coming from, from, from this region of the world? No. I mean, it just not, did not seem possible. No. No. Is that a real um, change or is that just a one-off? No, I think he's, no, I think there's, El Salvador is another one. Mm -hmm. um, Hungary, as much as I don't like the system, mm -hmm. they're not the United States of America. Right. Um, there are those who are standing up for principles. They may not be American, but they are mathematical principles. You mm -hmm. know, you can't just open your borders and expect everything to, it's math. It's just math. Mm. Um, and, you know, a year ago, two years ago for sure, I said, where's Winston Churchill? Where are the leaders that will buck the system? Well, you have it in Donald Trump. Like him or hate him, he's bucking the system. They are terrified of him at the World Economic Forum. Terrified. They know if he and his ilk continue to gain power, they're done. OK, they they have to win this election all over the world. Otherwise, it's just going to fall apart on them. Um, and that shows you the importance of this election. Um, but beside Donald Trump, who else was out there? Now you're starting to see three or four leaders duly elected that are standing up and telling the truth. I mean, Malay, he's speaking at the World Economic Forum. Yeah. And passionately. Passionately. Have you <laughs> yeah. seen his speech? I've seen clips of it. Yeah, yeah, he is passionately telling them, back off. Yeah, he's basically went there just to say, you suck really right. loudly to them over and over again. You have, we had on the radio show today, the head of uh, Heritage, mm. uh, and he was strangely invited to speak. And one of the reasons why he was invited to speak, he says, is because they know that conservative thought is ascendant. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted to get some voices there, but he's going to tell them the same thing. Stop it. You're fascistic. You're the one that's controlling. You're the one who has lost the trust because trust is earned and you've done everything you can to lose the trust. And tonight's TV show will show you exactly the same thing. It's going to be really good. Um, yeah. I am, oh, by the way, happy that you said that on camera because now we have the misinformation recorded. <laughs> we can send it directly to the World Economic <laughs> right. Forum and, right. and all the organizations, including The Independent, uh, which had a big report uh, uh, based on... Uh, research yeah. done by the Center for Countering Digital Hate. The story so, is uh, ca climate misinformation is mutating on YouTube and the platform is profiting. I'm in the middle of a meeting for the radio show tomorrow and mm -hmm. Nigel Farage just walks in. Did you see him? Yeah, I saw him, yeah. I saw him walk by. So he walks into the meeting and I'm like, <laughs> Aren't you know, you, you look at people <laughs> and you're like, you, these are the wrong surroundings. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, but he was on his way home. He missed a flight. So he's stranded here in Dallas. He has to do a show for GB News. And so he's going to be using our studios oh, cool. uh, at some point mm -hmm. uh, to do his GB News show. But uh, which, by the way, is beating the BBC, I understand. Wow. OK. Um, and we talked about the independent. And he said, oh, they're not good. <laughs> he said they are they are part of the system. And, you know, you know that. But when you read, when you see what they're saying at the World Economic Forum about misinformation and disinformation and how we have to go after and start silencing people right now, and then you see this in print today, it is why I built Blaze TV. Mm -hmm. It is, and it's weird, Stu, we've talked about this for a long time, uh, that it's coming, a day will come, a day will come. It's today. It, it, I mean, you were mentioning Facebook, right? Facebook, yeah. you're down by how many percent? 95%. Now, I see a lot of the business metrics. I see the <laughs> listenership numbers. Yeah. They're We've as high never, as they've ever been or higher. They're higher. We have a bigger footprint than we did at any point in my career, m meaning the Fox, the peak of Fox. The Fox, all mm -hmm. of that. We have a bigger f in, uh, footprint. We're doing better than we've ever, ever done before. And yet, some strange reason, <laughs> my traffic on Facebook, also YouTube, Instagram, all down. But Facebook is down 95%.
How's that possible? It's weird. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's almost inconsistent with reality. Right. And so for some, and this may be uh, the way they're going to do it, I hope this is as bad as it gets, but for some, they will just make you irrelevant. And I brought up Russell Brand. Russell Brand, they destroyed him through something that everybody knew 20 years ago. He's admitted it 20 years ago. He was a dirtbag. Mm -hmm. BBC made money off of him while he was popular until he started talking about the World Economic Forum. Then, all of a sudden, they had a problem with his activities 20 years ago. Okay, And he still does his podcast but I haven't seen him in my feed no. forever. And unless you're like a total fan. hardcore fan and you're looking for each episode, you know, a lot of people kind of have a passive way they deal with yeah. this stuff. If they see it in the feed, maybe they click on it and watch a video. That's not happening anymore for yeah, him a lot, and a bunch of others. A lot of influence comes from clips from the shows. You're not, I mean, how many, yeah. how many shows has the average person watched in its entirety or a majority of it from Joe Rogan? Right. Not if you're 26 if, hours long, how right. could you? I know. If you're listening every day, like us on radio, if you're at work and you're listening, or you're in a long car yeah. drive and listening, mm -hmm. but the average person gets bits and pieces of it, and it's all through social media. When you take that out, people just start to disappear, and you don't notice it. Mm. Okay? And that's why I said on the air, I did a really important monologue today, and I, I asked that you listen for more than words, um, but uh, things are changing. And if you're not a subscriber to Blaze TV, uh, if it's a financial thing, I completely understand that. Subscribe to my free email newsletter because that gives me your address and we know how to contact you. We know how to get to you um, because all of these third parties are going to make it impossible uh, for you to find us just by happenstance or to be informed, even if you follow us. Um, and I hope that's the only thing that they do, but I doubt it. Mm. Um, and uh, so please subscribe to Blaze TV because this is the time I foresaw, what, 10, 12 years ago and started the Blaze for. Yeah, it's blazetv.com uh, slash stew. Um, I, you know, it's interesting listening, looking at this article. The reason I brought this article up it, and you can get much more detail on the radio show if you want to go back and listen to the whole thing. But just to give you a little clip, um, they mentioned Blaze TV as kind of their test case. To, it's Blaze TV that's misleading people about the climate. Interesting apparently. that a English yeah. group why is focusing on Blaze and me, mm -hmm. isn't it? Very, very, very interesting. Yes. But let me give you one quote from the researchers on this. This is incredible. Uh, climate. This is why they are doing all this. Climate advocates and policymakers must recognize the shift, and they're saying from old school, what they call climate denialism, to this more nuanced new denialism. They're saying they must recognize the shift or risk losing the information battle necessary to deliver climate solutions. That is a loaded quote. That's not just, hey, we, don't, we want to make sure people know what's going on with the climate. That's the government needs to get involved or you're not going to get your trillion dollar, multi-trillion dollar policies you guys are pitching. Yep. That's a lot on the line. Yep. And that's something and, and you think I, they're going to act on. And I said, on. It's, but this time, it's not about climate. That's the vehicle to use. Mm. This is all about the election. And so you're going to see people like me start to be silenced and disappear. We will be behind. We'll still be there. But if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there, did it really fall? If I say something in a microphone, but there's nobody to hear it, does it matter? The answer is no. The Germans learned this by building the ghettos and putting the wall at the ghettos. They were all there. They were still saying things, but nobody could see them mm. uh, or hear them. This is what's happening, and it is all because of the election. All of it is because of the election. I can't even imagine what they're going to be doing advancing in into this year. Oh my gosh. When this is when the general election is here, I mean the the suppression and is going to be serious. If our audience still is responding and hearing us, if and I don't know how they would measure that. Uh, we can measure that, but I'm sure they can too. If the audience is still there, then they'll have to take more drastic steps. And that will be debanking um, mm. you know, making sure people can't use their credit card to be able to subscribe to The Blaze. 
Yeah, whenever I try to buy illegal drugs online, they reject the transaction. <laughs> they could do the same right, well, thing with us. He, it's just, right, uh, right. you know, this is the problem with, right. with the, the world today. Not quite, but... Close. Okay. It's a good example, Glenn. <laughs> Trust really, me. You try to buy heroin <laughs> on the Internet these days without, without cryptocurrency. It's very I'm going to say no to that. Okay. Uh, that. Uh, the uh, special tonight is going to be a really important one. We talked to you about Blaze TV, and it's very true, going back to the beginning. This is why this place exists for this exact moment. So, And remember when I said that? Even to me, it sounded crazy. It sounded crazy. Like, I mean, like, it just, it, this I is said, America. It yeah. should sound freaking crazy. Yeah. I said at the time, I first started saying, we have to get out of the mainstream media. It's going to implode. They're going to so discredit mm -hmm. it, it will implode, and we don't want to be anywhere near it. Then we had the idea of Blaze TV, and I said, we have to get out. We have to be able to rely only on the people we serve, and those are not the advertisers, and they're certainly not corporations. They're the people. So it came up with Blaze TV. Stu, people don't realize HBO wasn't streaming, Netflix, Amazon, no one was streaming. Mm -hmm. We were the first information. It was Major League Baseball yeah. and us. That's it. That's how crazy it was at the time. And now is the time for which it was built. Mm. BlazeTV.com slash Stu. BlazeTV.com slash Stu. Join us. Uh, this year is going to be more important than ever. By the you way, use the promo code Glen 30 and uh, you'll get 30% off your subscription. Oh, get some extra cash, yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I don't know what, I don't think they gave me the $30 code. No, I think I don't they think only so. gave me a $10 code. Whatever. Yeah. Use Glenn30 at blazetv.com slash stew and use uh, your membership to watch the special tonight. Globalist takeover of America's economy is nearly complete. Stay tuned for that. Glenn, thanks for coming on. Thank you. I want to thank you for checking out the show today and clicking off whatever pornography you were watching before this. It's always appreciated uh, that you uh, tune in here, and I'd like to keep as much separation between those two things as possible. But here, we have to kind of fuse them together. Why? Well, we have a story about porn. Yes, we do. Ohio lawmakers want to require ID to watch online pornography. Now, this is such an, inter it's an interesting topic because... I don't know. I feel like the amount of people who are going to be willing to give their actual photo ID to a porn company is going to be low. It's going to be low. I don't think most people are going to want to do that. And I don't know that necessarily it's going to stop people from watching porn online. I mean, there's going to be this has happened with other digital businesses like, you know, gambling and, you know, cryptocurrency and stuff. Some companies are going to say, well, we want to be legitimate, so we're going to go and deal with all these government restrictions. And others are just going to be able to float on the Internet and do what they want. And so a lot of people wind up going to the less reputable people. Now, I don't know if that exactly fits with porn. I'm not sure exactly, but the point is, I just don't think that a lot of people are going to be doing this. You know, I, you know, look, I think people watching less porn, probably a good thing. So maybe that will work, though. I don't know if it's going to be necessarily fully successful. My guess is it's going to be really hard to regulate this particular uh, program. But it is interesting that they're requiring ID. Keep that in the back of your mind for a second. We also have Costco. They're testing a new system. They are uh, they're, they're see, they, they've caught you. OK, they know what you're doing. They know what you're doing at Costco. You don't want to pay for the Costco membership, but you want the 900 pack of the fruit snacks, right? So what are you doing? Well, you're taking your friend's membership and you're walking in and you're kind of just keeping your head down and walking and showing, showing the little card as you walk in. And then you go and you get all your uh, fruit snacks and granola bars and, and, and uh, you know, 48 packs of water. And then you bring it to the checkout, but there's a self-checkout now, so you don't have to really deal with anyone. They're not going to really look at the picture. And then you get out of there scot-free. They've noticed. They've seen you doing it. Okay? So what are they going to do? They have a new system. They're going to be checking your ID to match it up with the name. And, you know, it's interesting. Here we are in a country that thinks your Costco membership it's so important that you have to check ID to go to Costco. And whatever weird thing you're doing uh, with your laptop in your bedroom, you also got to check ID to see that. In fact, we can all think of thousands of different things 
that you need ID for. But the one thing you don't need ID for, of course, is voting, at least in a lot of states. They're going to mail you a ballot to your house. They're not even going to they're not going to make you ask for it. They think so little of this institution of American culture. But for porn and for Costco, vital that they see your ID. Think of all the different times you use your ID to just handle normal everyday tasks. And yet they will tell you that somehow voting doesn't rise to the level of your Costco habit or your porn habit. My thought would be it's even more important than what you're buying at Costco. You know, getting discounted, because you can always just buy an extra 24 pack of the granola bars and bring them to your friend. I don't think that's gonna be that big of a hassle for Costco to deal with. But vote it, that's central. It's central to our democracy, which by the way, we do not have. We have a constitutional republic with elements of democracy inside of it. But still, it is a fascinating thing that the media has told you over and over again, these voter ID rules, they screw over the little guy. And at the same time, Costco and porn seem to have this all worked out. New poll out from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution shows some bad news uh, for President uh, Biden. He's down 45 to 37 to President Trump. Now, of course, famously in Georgia, it was a pretty darn close election. And it's funny because the Georgia electorate, they're not as friendly to Donald Trump as a, 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 the state of a similar makeup. And what I mean by this is if you see Trump, he went in there, he obviously lost this state. He was very upset about it. This is the one he talked about. I mean, he's dealing with the legal problems associated with that now. But, you know, they also went and reelected the governor that Trump hated. He put up a, an alternative Senate candidate. Uh, they got, uh, or no, there was a governor candidate. He blew him out in the uh, primary. Then he got overwhelmingly elected. Kemp, uh, even Raffensperger got, uh, got reelected in Georgia. So, you know, you wouldn't know that necessarily the most pro-Trump state, yet here they are showing a blowout. Part of this might be another poll. And I went to this, the real source for this, Teen Vogue. Uh, Teen Vogue. Teen Vogue says, hey, Gen Z is not going to show up in this election. This is a problem. We want the Democrat to be elected. And this is the problem um, when you rely on these types of voters. 57% of Americans between ages 18 and 29 were planning to vote in 2020. That has now declined to 49%. That's going to make a difference, in a, especially in a close election in a close state. And uh, the younger voters only see uh, the approval of 35% for President Biden. The issue here is when you're depending on voters who don't really follow things, they don't really want to show up too much, they don't really know the news, you got to excite them with something else. President Obama did that with these big barriers he was breaking. President Biden didn't. He does not do that. He does not get anybody excited. And that could be a massive problem for Democrats in 2024. Head over to studosmerch.com. Get your election merchandise, your uh, man, all sorts of great conservative stuff at studosmerch.com. You can save 10% if you use the code STU10. Get your stuff now so you can wear it through the election season a little bit, not just, you know, wear it, I mean, ordering. I'm going to order it in October. I mean, you're not going to have any time to wear it. Order it early before Biden's, uh, you know, hopefully defeated and out of office. Studosmerch.com. Code is STU10.